Have you ever sat down and actually written out everything that goes into creating your podcast from how you come up with ideas all the way through to how you're promoting those episodes? I'm 100% sure there are ways that you could probably be automating those. Today's guest, Joe, is a podcast automations guru, and he has been able to create processes that allow him to show up very regularly with three podcasts while also being a parent and a busy business owner. In today's episode, we're talking through a lot of those quick wins that you can have as a podcaster, get back some of that time so you're not worrying every single week about what it is that's going to be on your show. You are planned and prepared and ready to tackle everything else that is on your to-do list rather than just your podcast. Please join me in welcoming Joe to the podcast. Joe, thank you so much for being on the show today. I am very excited to talk to someone who's been in podcasting and been a guest for podcasting for quite some time. So if you could start by telling everyone who you are, what you do, and about your podcasts, and then we'll get into uh, your podcasting journey. I'm excited. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. I have been podcasting for uh, about 12 years now. I um, started my first podcast in 2012. It was what every white guy's podcast is in 2012, which is just like a bunch of dudes talking about things we don't know anything about. Didn't go super well. Uh, Thank you for like saying that, though, because (laughs) I thought I was the only one who thought that. But yeah, (laughs) no, I'm, uh, (laughs) I'm very strong, strong opinion on that one. But I loved the format. I'm I'm an extrovert. I work from home. And for a while, I was teaching in the classroom. And that's kind of how I got like my extrovert energy out. But since moving away from the University of Scranton, my alma mater, where I taught, I um, really leaned into podcasting as a way to meet and talk with people. And so my flagship show, I guess, depending on when this interview comes out, is currently, as we record it, called How I Built It but will be renamed the Streamlined Solopreneur, which is like a very scary thing. It's an eight-year-old show, over 400 episodes, and I'm going to rename it because the mission has changed. Kind of as you alluded to, right? Like I had a a previous life where I was a web developer, and that's what the show was focused on. But now I am a podcast coach. I help people save 12 hours a week with their processes, and the name How I Built It just didn't make sense anymore. Let's talk about that for a second, because we talked about rebrands and shifting and allowing ourselves as podcasters to let go of kind of our journey, but be able to keep the audience, especially if the audience isn't really changing much, but your, your mission and your content is, is seeing those little tweaks and those little shifts. And so how are you kind of feeling around that? I've seen people be like, yep, I'm going to, I'm going to change it. Who cares? It's fine. Everybody's with me. They're coming along whether they want to or not. And then I've seen other people like really struggle with like a year long decision making of trying to change this. So how have you kind of landed in that? Yeah. So I, I have another show that has had, I think three names in four years, just cause like it's very experimental and I'm trying to like find kind of the right. And it started off as like, make money podcasting. And I was like, it's amazing that this name isn't taken. And then I realized like it wasn't taken because it was bad, you know, (laughs) like, (laughs) and now I've settled on like podcast workflows for that one. And that was just like kind of change it every season or change it because the audience was not like the catalog wasn't there and the audience was still growing. But for this one, right, it's eight years. And if I'm being honest with you, I've known in the back of my mind for a very long time, this show Mm -hmm launched three months before NPR's How I Built This with Guy Raz. And I was super stubborn about not changing it then. I was like, I was here first. And like, I've already got so many downloads and sponsors. And like, I didn't think it mattered that much. And it it didn't, right? Because at the end of, or like in the middle, really, of that show at that time, I would always say, so tell us, how did you build that, right? Like the title was the main question. So I haven't asked, how did you build that in a couple of years now? And uh, as I was writing a blog post about how I need to redesign my artwork, I'm like, the artwork doesn't really say anything about the show. And I'm like, neither does the name. And if I was one of my clients auditing the show, giving advice, 
I would say, what does your name have to do with your podcast? And I, I figured I better put my money where my mouth is. So I decided in like late February, maybe early March, that I'm going to change the name. I spent a couple of weeks. There's, there's like the whole behind the scenes thing on my show, like a couple of weeks kind of figuring out the name, redesigning the artwork. And now as I've got those nailed down, I'm going to like redesign the website, make the switch, do all the web developer stuff that I know how to do from my past. But so the quick answer is I decided and then like a month later, I'm, I'm about ready to do it. The honest answer is I've known for a couple of years I need to do it and just haven't pulled the trigger. Yeah, which is okay, right? I think so often we we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as creators and pumping out tons of content that we always have to be on point. And it's like, that's not really how it always works. There are times in our lives and ebbs and flows when we're like really excited about the content or really excited about our show. And then there are times when we're not. And it's like, you have to decide, are you going to hype yourself up and try to be excited or do you need to make a shift? And you just have to come to come to terms with that. So thank you for sharing that. Tell us a little bit about, you talk a lot about like podcast automations and I am someone who like, my past life is in manufacturing and supply chain. So I've written mm. so many SOPs. I am all about like how to make things more efficient, more effective, get things done quicker, cut out all the extra stuff. So tell us a little bit about how you got into automations for podcasting. Yeah. So there were, I think, two flashpoints, right? The quick like kind of preamble, the prologue is that I now have three children. When I had one child, she was two my babysitter uh, left us for the summer. I was struggling. And one of my friends said, you should do less. And I internalized that as I'm going to do the same amount of stuff and just automate some of it. And what re he really meant was like kill projects, right? Or sunset projects, yeah. right? But I'm stubborn. So that was kind of the prologue. In November 2020, right? Crazy thing happened that year, right? Um, yep. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> I had my, yeah. I had my first and only panic attack. Uh, my wife is a nurse. I had two children at this time. And so since I was self-employed, I was able to take the time off and she was like literally saving people's lives. So I did the stay at home dad thing for most of the week, which means that my business and my podcast, which was my main income generator at that point, was kind of put on the back burner. And there was one morning in November where my three-year-old daughter was being especially needy and my six-month-old son had just like thrown up everything he ate and was screaming and crying. And I was trying to get work done because I thought this was the best time for me to get it done aside from nap time. And I just find myself like on the floor of my kitchen, like leaning against the refrigerator, crying uncontrollably. And my daughter comes up to me, three years old, with a bottle of water and a towel. And she says, it's okay, daddy. Everything's going to be okay. And I made a promise to myself then that this will never happen. My three-year-old shouldn't be taking care of me. And so the next week I hired an assistant, like a virtual assistant, to do anything that I didn't personally need to do. And I doubled down on automation. And fast forward to November 2021, we welcomed our third into the world. I wasn't stressed. I wasn't panicking. I took a whole month off to spend with our new family because I had put these processes in place. And so you know, I'm doing what I do now because I don't want people to have to have a panic attack to realize this. Uh, I want them to just realize it and I want to help them do it. First and foremost, all the props to you. Any parent who tries to <laughs> parent and run a business, run a content machine, all the props to them. I am very open that my husband is a stay-at-home dad. He has been a stay-at-home dad for the last... I want to say seven years now. Wow. And like, I have zero desire to do that. He handles mm -hmm. the kids. I run my business. He handles the home and cleans everything. And I run my business and bring in the money. And like, I'm very clear when I talk about like how much space I have to be able to mm -hmm. do things. There is no way that I would be able to do that while also trying to manage kids. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely not. So, so much props to you. And for all the parents out there who do this, right, I, my hat's off to you. And to have that moment, I think that 
a lot of us have had the kind of like, oh, no, this is not working. (laughs) This is not how it needs to be. And so when you said you hired a virtual assistant, my control freak brain is like, oh, God, that's terrifying. Right. And I have team members. I, you know, hand things off to them. I've personally trained them. How did you get to the point where you were like, was it kind of like that? All right, this is my come to myself moment and I just have to give it over? Or was it like, oh, this is a bit of a struggle, but I know I need to do it, but I kind of don't want to. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's exactly it, right? That's another thing that I knew for a while I should do and I just wasn't willing to let go, right? And I should say like, my wife has been so supportive of like me doing the business and like she does have a flexible schedule. And so like we try, she, she says that I like evenly split the home stuff. I feel like I, she does more than me, but like I'll I'll leave that to her judgment. And so, you know, we definitely make it work in like a non-traditional two working parents sort of way. But uh, yeah, it was like at that moment I was like, yeah, this can't happen again. And so I need to let go. And you know what? You know what I came to learn? Like my VA, she was out sick a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, gosh, she does all of this better than I do now. I was like, how do I publish my podcast again? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> it's like, cause it's like a multiple step process. I publish yeah. in Transistor and then I put it on my WordPress website. And there's just like many steps. And if I forget one, then like things aren't as smooth. And, and she keeps the wheels on the bus. Yes. That's where SOPs are so important. And that's why mm-hmm. like for, I mean, we manage 10 to 15 shows a week and we have processes because every person's workflow is different, which leads me to these automations, right? When it comes to coming up with automations that are going to work best for specific people, how do you work that out? Like, I know you're probably going to have to sit down and talk to them, see what their life looks like, see what their workflow currently looks like and see how you're going to have to optimize it. But what does that kind of process start like? Yeah, great question. So something I promised myself when I started doing this was I wasn't going to impose my tools on people, right? Because in the web development space, I would hear all the time from freelancers, oh, well, they're on GoDaddy. So I'm going to, I hate GoDaddy. So I'm going to make them move to the host that I like. And I'm like, are they happy with GoDaddy though? Like, what do you, if it's not a job that you're going to like, don't take it, right? Don't like force Mm -hmm. these new things. on. So that was the promise I made to myself, which means I sit down with all of my potential clients especially established podcasters. So like there's established podcasters, there's new podcasters. With new podcasters who haven't launched yet, I feel out their comfort level with the tools. And then I make recommendations based on that. With established podcasters, I say, tell me everything that you do for your show. And the way that conversation usually goes, like the abridged version of it is, oh, well, I find guests, I record with them, I edit it, and then I publish it. And I'm like, no, no, you skipped 40 to 50 steps. (laughs) Yeah. How do you find guests? What do you use? How do you book with them? Oh, we just go back and forth and email. And okay, I clock that in my head. Okay, uh, let's not do that anymore, right? How do you keep track of your episodes? Oh, I, I use a notebook or like I have like one really long Google Doc and I'm like, cool, I clock that. And so we go through the whole process. We have, you know, like an outline of their SOPs. And then from there I go, okay, where do you feel you spend the most time? And then what are the easy wins? Using a scheduler, easy win, right? Yeah. Where do you feel you spend the most time editing? This is going to be an investment, but you should hire an editor or we Mm -hmm. need to simplify your process so you're not editing as much. One of those. Yeah. And there's so many different ways to go about it, right? Like like just the editing specifically. Obviously, we do a ton of editing for our clients and we go really deep in the editing side. So like a lot of production companies, they're like, sure, we'll take out the ums, the errs, the false starts, all of that. We clean it up. Whereas my company, we're like, no, we'll take out the bad joke that landed wrong. We And we take more mm-hmm. creative liberty with our clients. And that's what they want, right? They want someone who can make sure that the podcast, especially in election years, is aligned <laughs> with their brand and with their values, right? So that's very different. But not everyone wants that. Some people are like, keep in the ums, keep in the, oh, wait, I didn't mean to say that. And that's fine. There's two completely different types of people there. And I love what you said about the quick wins. Right. So what are some other ones that if people are like, okay, I'm thinking about my process and let's say I just write it all down. What does my current workflow look like? Where are some places you mentioned the scheduler? Where are some other places where they can really get those quick wins? I think that there's the next part in scheduling, right? Scheduling to some sort of planner, right? Because you, if you don't have a planner, you're either doing this, you're publishing week to week 
And that's how you miss an episode and get overwhelmed. And you're like, I got to publish now. Or you're trying to keep track of five, four episodes, maybe eight episodes in your head all at the same time. And so if they don't have a preferred, let's say project management tool, but it's, that's mm-hmm. like a very generous nomenclature. If they don't have one, I'll usually recommend Trello or Google Sheets. Yep. Those are free and easy to use. Uh, and we just send the the information over there, right? And then the other thing that I'll recommend they do is, and this does take a little bit of time to like training and, and kind of like practice is I tell them to take notes during the interview and they don't have to be super deep notes. It could just be like time dash edit, right? Uh, because most people I talk to them will do the interview. They'll be fully engaged, which is really important, right? You need right. to be fully. This is why it takes practice because I'm fully engaged also taking notes, right? But then you don't have to go and listen, even if you're listening at 2x, right? You don't have to go listen to that again. You can just send it to your editor and say, hey, here, I messed up Alicia's name. So can you cut that out, right? Here, I made a joke that didn't land. So can you cut that out, right? At 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, maybe we hit a really good cold open. Like, can you use that quote in the cold open, right? Yeah. And with tools like Descript, if you have the timestamps, or just like the words now, like you can search the transcript there. So that will speed up your process a lot by basically cutting in half the amount of time you have to listen to your episodes to figure out what you're going to edit. And pro tip for solo episodes, pause. <laughs> I tell our clients this constantly. So often we try to barrel through our mistakes. <laughs> And so it's so much more difficult to edit after the fact when if you just take a breath, what was I talking about? Okay, restart that phrase. You can see very clearly see that long pause in the either whether you're using audio or if you're using the transcript, you can see those pauses really easily, especially in Riverside and Descript to be able to make those edits. So pro tip for (laughs) those who are doing solo episodes. But yeah, for guests, it's so hard because you are trying to be very engaged and excited and keep it. Okay, where where was my next question going? Or what were we talking about? So I like that idea of just like even a little note. I know in Riverside, they also have a mark clip. So you can add a marker of like this Mm, thing. So you just click as like a note of this timestamp. So that's really cool too. I don't know if the other tools have it. I like Riverside. So that's why I mentioned that one. I did try Squadcast for a while because I was paying for Descript anyway. And then like I, I ended up not paying for Descript and not and like going back to Riverside. It was like, it was a rough loss for, for Descript, I feel. But uh, yeah, I really love Riverside. I'll clap my hands because that makes like a long line on the wave file. But a long pause, if especially if you're using Descript or Riverside, probably works a little bit better, right? Because in Descript, they have like the little like, gray icon like gray dots for the length of the Mm -hmm. pause so that's maybe a little bit more visual yeah i was recording an episode for my team the other day for my successful podcasting unlocked podcast which is all solo episodes 10 minutes or less and i was having like a sneezing fit in the middle and i literally just muted my mic and was able to easily see that like those big breaks of gray Mm -hmm. in the audio it was like Perfect. So I can easily edit that out or my team can easily edit that out without having to stress about, oh, where was she having that crazy sneezing fit? And you just blew out my ears. Thanks, Alicia. (laughs) We don't need that. So you know what a a super cool app is? I know for sure it's on the Mac. I think it's also on Windows now, too, though. It's called ReCut. It started off as a like instructional video editor. And you're nodding your head like maybe you've heard of this. So for those No, who but I love tools. Oh, <laughs> so I'm like, yes. Great. So <laughs> you drop audio and then you like set a threshold and it will automatically rem- remove long pauses. Nice. And like when I'm like making tutorials and I do that or like, it, you know, it like edits out silences and stuff like that. It's just that first pass is so much easier, right? Because then I don't have to look for the long pauses and then it will export directly to certain apps, ScreenFlow, Final Cut Pro, Premiere, DaVinci, so, or just a a straight up audio or video file that then you can import into Descript. So that's a really good first pass. Is that for video? Silences. Video and audio. Okay, nice. So we use Auphonic and sometimes for clients that maybe say a lot of ums, since Auphonic Mm -hmm. has that new tool that removes those for you from the audio. And then they also have a filter for pauses as well. Sometimes they cut it a little short. So I I like to just 
do a pass through just to make sure. But for that initial, I mean, we have one client where she says a ton of ums and it'll be like three minutes cut off by that at the end. And you're just like, okay, cool. Moving on. I'm, I've been bullish on like keep the ums because they're natural, but. I also like the thing that made me hire an editor was in, in one of my early interviews, my guest said, um, a lot. And so I edited out like three of the four. And then I was like, I, this is before any of those tools that, right. This was like 2016. Right. <laughs> and, uh, after that I was like, yeah, uh, I'm going to hire an editor to do this. Cause this just took me like two hours. Yeah. That's a lot of work. <laughs> so yeah. these tools are great. Where are some other places? So we mentioned that beginning during the initial interview, we've talked a little bit about some editing tools as well. What about that post-production? I am iffy <laughs> about some of the podcasting tools personally that are coming out for like writing show notes for you or writing captions for you or titling your episodes or pulling the reels or the shorts or the TikToks, a lot of those tools, they try to gear them towards podcasters, but I don't know that they always make the most sense for people. But what are some that you're you're really liking? Those are really tough. I haven't really found a good one I like. I mean, I'm a writer. So like some people are like, oh no, chat, well, chat GPT writes is good. And I'm like, is it though? Like they said plethora. Like no one says plethora. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> like, I like, cause I tried it, right? I did a, a video yesterday and i was like oh write a write a youtube style description for this uh, and they always put it in the third person which drives me crazy uh, yeah like i always ask you to put it just remember i want it in first person but with the plethora of transcription tools out there which one should you choose like you have me saying it like, you don't need like use the words that i used for that sentence so in post-production land right uh right after editing i have a this is gonna sound complicated just remember that I've been building these processes for years, but I have a process that will download the files from Riverside, automatically rename them and put them in a folder. I'll tack the episode number onto that. When that folder has like four files in it, it's me, the guest, my cold intro or cold open, uh, and then the instructions files, it moves it in Dropbox and emails my editor. Nice. My editor edits it, uploads it back to Dropbox. My VA gets the email that it's ready for publish statuses are updated in notion that's really strong right because after i record the intro i don't see the like i don't have to check my editor's work anymore this is going to sound really risky i think to a lot of people and if i have some time and i get it i'll I'll upload it to overcast and listen on like 2x while i'm driving my kids to school but usually i don't feel like i need to check his work anymore because we've been working together for so long so when it comes to the post-production kind of share stuff i recently said like forget the clips right? The clips are, if you're trying to grow your podcast, clips on social media are not going to grow your podcast. If you're just looking for content, great, fine, right? Like yeah. if you want to take, but what I will do, because I think that this is faster personally, mm-hmm. is I will record a recap, say, hey, I just spoke to Alicia. We talked about all of these great things. Uh, one of my favorite things that she mentioned was blah, 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 right? And then I'll upload that look for the episode to come out soon or like follow up tweet, join my mailing list, right? That is faster, more succinct, and you're not fighting AI tools to figure out the best quote, I think. Yeah, I love that too. Where do you record that? Like in your workflow? So like a lot of times we'll make sure we keep telling our clients. (laughs) I think one client even said, oh no, my editor is going to chase me down with a bat because I need to record the setups. And I'm like, yeah, record the setups of the day of, please. Um, <laughs> we took that out, by the way. Yeah. Nobody, <laughs> we're not actually going to chase him around, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but. <laughs> so when do you record that? Is it the day of where you're like top of mind because you're batch recording, obviously? Or is it the day it goes live and you're like, okay, it's live. This is how I look today. Let's go. Yeah, great question. I have, I set up a reminder. Again, this is part of the automation, right? When someone mm-hmm. books in Calendly, it sends a task to my task manager, do on the day we record, right? Summary for blah, blah interview, right? I book a, like the calendar slot is 90 minutes. I don't do, I don't go 90 minutes. Usually I, I have recently, but usually I don't, right? It's like a 10 minute pre interview. And unless we have significant technical issues, I try to do a tight 45, right? We have our document. I've broken up our interview in act one, act two, and act three. And we tell a good story that way. And then after 
I do the summary. And if I'm going to record a video, that's when I record it, right? I open up mm -hmm. Ecamm Live usually. I love Ecamm Live. And just because I just did it, right? I'm really excited about what we talked about. The episode might not come out for like a month and a half. And then I'm like, what did we, a million years have happened. My kids were off for five days. Like those are just lost days now. I don't know what we talked about. Yeah. Then I need to rely on like the summary that I wrote or some AI tool to surface a quote. So I like to do it right after because that's when I'm freshest and most excited about it. That's the key part, right? That's when you're most excited about it. If you go back after the fact, and this is why we really push our clients to record that setup right after the interview, because there's excitement there. You had a great conversation. You are also wearing the same clothes if you're doing video, right? So yeah. it helps with like the transitions. But like you have that, oh, we talked about this. We talked about this. Make sure you look out for this part. Let's get into it. It makes it so much easier to keep that level rather than if you go back later, you're like, like you said, what did we talk about? And I'm curious, and I feel like this would be a really good tip if you talk about doing this, for, like being a guest on other people's podcasts, right? So recently we had a client where he sent me some information to promote on his socials that he was a guest on a show. The host <laughs> titled the episode his name and the description was his bio. And I was like, yeah, I'm not spending 45 minutes listening to this. So I downloaded it, threw it into Otter AI, told Otter to give me an overview of the conversation because <laughs> I'm not going to do all that. And yeah. most people are going to be like, oh, yeah, I had a great chat with so-and-so moving on. But like just thinking as a guest, if especially if you're trying to grow your podcast, it's one of the best ways to grow your own show, being a guest on other people's podcasts. After you've had that interview, while you still have that excitement Record a little snippet, have that thing and put it on social media. Hey, we had this chat. I can't wait for it to come out. Be sure to look out for it. And then you can record another one, literally 30 seconds, 90 seconds at most. That's like, hey, the episode's live today. Obviously, it's not live that day. <laughs> Just save it for later. Right. Absolutely. Like, and, and that like blocking the time to do that and making the space to do that is really the most important part, right? Because the day the episode comes out, you could be on vacation. You could be in the middle of something, right? I've made courses for LinkedIn Learning where like I was incommunicado for like three straight days, right? Like if the episode came out like the evening before or anytime, like I wasn't sharing it or talking about it at all. Right. right. So uh, yeah, make the time and space to do that. And it's, it's really important, right? It's almost like the first time I saw The Last Jedi, I love Star Wars. The Same. first time I saw The Last <laughs> Jedi, right? I was like this, or or maybe it was Rise of Skywalker, right? It was like, I'm like, this movie was amazing, super satisfying. I'm so glad. And then like the second time I watched it, I was like, somehow Palpatine came back. Like that was, that's not a great line. Spoiler uh, alert. If you have yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert. If you haven't seen it. Uh, <laughs> that's like so memed. Uh, I'm sorry if I just ruined the last, the Rise of Skywalker for you. But it's like, you know, you're so excited to see the movie that you're not really thinking of, like you're just like processing the events. But then like later under scrutiny, you might think, oh, I, I guess I missed that or I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so do things when the excitement level is highest. Yeah, I think it makes such a difference. Is there anything else that we missed in kind of this places where we can get those quick wins and automating our processes for podcasting? Obviously, batch record, plan ahead, mm -hmm. don't, you know, go by every week. And I've had people ask me, I like to kind of fly that by the seat of my pants. I don't like to plan too far ahead because I like to be more in flow. And I'm like, at least plan for a month. Just at yeah. least give yourself a month if you are someone who doesn't want to do that. Or like give yourself in case of emergency break glass episodes, right? Because yeah. like... I was sick one week and that I was going to record like a, a timely, like kind of news based episode. And I'm like, great. Like, I can't talk. I can't be on camera. Like I look like Rocky after he fought the Russian or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. So at least like have some emergency episodes, right? The two things that I think we haven't discussed yet. We touched on SOPs, right? Yeah. SOPs are so important. So if you don't know what you do, right, that's like one of the big benefits that I see when I ask people this, like, tell me everything you do, they actually think about it. So one thing that you can do is I've been time tracking a lot lately. I use Toggle and then the iPhone app or the iOS app, Timery on top of it. Excellent, excellent app. Um, but if you don't want to use an app, right, just like keep a notebook or a notepad next to you 
and just write write down things as you're doing them so you can at least see all the stuff you do right because it's easy to generalize and be like oh yeah so i i, I book i record i edit i publish right it's it's not that bad but it's really like i do you know i figure out the guest i got to ask them questions then we have to do the dance of like are you using a blue yeti are you talking into the top of it Cause like, we need to fix that. Right. You know, are you wearing headphones? Oh, well, I never wear headphones. Nobody else has said anything about it. Okay. Well, those people were really nice. I'm not that nice. I want good audio. I want you to sound good. I want me to sound good. So, you know, write down all of that. And then the other thing is interview podcasts are still the most popular format. And if you do an interview and you like doing interview podcasts, that's great. You don't only have to do interviews though. Mini episodes, right? Alicia, like you mentioned, I'll do. I'm trying to do 50-50 this year where it's like 50% interviews, 50% solo episodes. Yeah. You can do three solo episodes in like an hour, right? If you're like prepared, if you don't know what to talk about, maybe you have a newsletter or a blog post that you wrote or you want to revisit something that you talked about last year. Mm -hmm. Those will give you a ton of margin. You can do them on your own time. And if your podcast is aligned with your area of expertise, you don't need to do a ton of research, right? Like a lot of my solo episodes now are about my podcast rebrand. I'm building in public. I don't have to do like I'm doing research for that and doing work for that. And then I'm talking about that work so people can see how I'm handling it. And that's giving me a wealth of content that I don't need to schedule interviews for. Yes. Uh, I just batch recorded since I have this podcast, which is obviously more interview style and then launched the other one in January of 2024, depending on when people are listening to this <laughs> and found that I can batch record four episodes and they're 10 minutes or less, right? I'm just answering mm-hmm. podcasting questions, 10 minutes or less quick. I have my, I got my outfit changes set out since it's going to be on video as well. I've got all of them mapped out and planned out. I like to go by like more bullet point style or outline style when I'm talking just to keep my, my brain on task. And I was able to get within two hours, I got four of those episodes done. And then one that was about 30 minutes for listeners to lead. And so I was talking about podcast marketing strategies and like was able to batch all of those. And also it helped because a couple of weeks ago, I was very sick and did not have a mm-hmm. voice, but it already batched all those solo episodes and wasn't running like every week. Oh no, what in the world am I going to talk about this week? I feel sick. I have no voice. What am I going to do? And so when I'm feeling well, I can batch record those and my team knows what to do with it. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about it until it goes out and then I can promote it. Right. So yeah, I 100% agree. And I think that if we give ourselves some space, it's okay to do solo episodes. And it, it's actually very important, I think, to do solo episodes because it allows you to show at yourself as a leader in your industry, as a thought leader, someone who understands and knows their stuff. And also that no like and trust factor happens so much quicker when you are able to show up as an expert and give guidance to people. But if you are having only interview style shows, you're not always able to weave those in. And sometimes it can take away from the conversation. So you got to find that balance of solos. And also, this is something I did last year, like you said, where you're kind of balancing solo guest, solo guest. I did that last year. And then this year I was like, nope, I think I'm going to go more with the other one and mostly do interviews on this one. And as I feel inspired, then I'll have solo episodes or longer style solo episodes. So you can change your format and you're the way that you're approaching the consistency whenever you want. Yeah. The beauty of your podcast, right? Is it's not like a house, right? Like once it's built, it's built. You're probably like, you could change the artwork every day if you want, right? I don't recommend that, but you could, uh, you can change the format. You can experiment with formats, right? Maybe I'll experiment with having a friend come on as a co-host once a month. Right. And, and try to set up that banter, but I agree wholeheartedly. You know, I, you mentioned that you have an interview coming out on storytelling, uh, or maybe it's out as Pete, you know, like breaking the fourth wall here. But uh, something I tell people all the time, right, is in our hero's journey, our listener is the hero, which means you're the guide or your guest is the guide. And if you're using your show to establish your expertise and your authority, you should be the guide for at least part of the time, right? So yes. uh, solo shows allow you to do that. I 100% agree. Anything else that we've missed that's like, you can't leave without knowing this? 
I, you know, I think a question I get all the time is like, how often? I'm sure you've probably covered this on your show a lot. The thing you need to remember, I won't give you, right? It's whatever your capacity is, really. However long it needs to be, right? When I taught in college, like people hate, my students yeah. hated that answer. But it's the goal here is to make your podcast part of your listeners routine. You want it to be mm-hmm. a habit. And so I think weekly is a good way to form that habit, right? Oh, I get to listen to talking yanks every morning, right? On the way to school or drop off or whatever. Two weeks or fort- fortnightly could also work. I think monthly is, is too long. You know, I know successful shows that are monthly, they generally already have a big audience. And so they can just kind of do something and, and enough people will listen. But especially if you're starting out, it's real easy to forget about your podcast if I hear it once and then a month goes by. Mm-hmm. So just consider that, especially if you're pre-launch. Like this is the best time to to batch episodes. Get 12 or 20 episodes in the tank before you launch, right? There's not going to be a huge difference between you launching today and launching three or four weeks from now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I did a little bit of a test when when we launch Listeners to Leads. We typically, when we're launching clients, we'll do a teaser or the trailer, and then we'll do three episodes on launch day, and then we try to go with a weekly or biweekly cadence. And I tested it out with doing 10 episodes launched for this one on launch day, and it didn't make a difference at all. So have a couple there and then just set the rest (laughs) to be scheduled out, right? I do have an episode on Successful Podcasting Unlocked. I believe it went live a few weeks ago where it talked about If content is king, consistency is queen, then your capacity is the key because Mm. content is king. Sure. (laughs) And like showing up consistently. Yes. Okay. Yes. Both of those go hand in hand and they're so important, but your own capacity gets to drive what that looks like and what expectation you set for your audience, but you better show up. (laughs) So I kind of like married all of that together. And yeah, I think it's so important podcast listeners are finicky. And if you stop showing up, they will move on to the next. There are tons of other shows for them to listen to. So yeah, that consistency piece is so important. Joe, thank you so much. This has been so incredible. And I got some new tools that I can try out and check out. So I'm very happy about that. And I feel like we really covered so much of of those little wins that people can accomplish. And if people are like, well, I just, I need help. (laughs) Where can they go to learn more about how to work with you, listen to your shows, all of that fun stuff? Yeah. So you can head over to, uh, we'll do casabona.org slash Alicia. That will be a special landing page. So it'll have my podcast there, my socials. And then you, there'll also be an email opt-in to get my automations database. So if you just want like a bunch of templates to get you started quickly, you can get all of that there. Perfect. We'll make sure we have that linked in the show notes as well as uh, the blog post in case people are driving or doing other things while they're listening to this. So please be sure to go check those out as well. Joe, thank you so much. This has been so good. My absolute pleasure, Alicia. Thanks so much for having me. 